The first question, Ajahn, yes. is this. When it's dark, I get scared. I think about ghosts. What can I do to get over this? <laughs> One thing. Don't get scared of things. See the advantages in them. One thing about ghosts is they're great at lottery numbers. <laughs> There's one English girl years ago, it's called the Tsunami Ghost Story, true story. She woke up in the town of Krabi in southern Thailand, actually not waking up yet, she had a dream of this English girl, maybe about 19 or 20, uh, in a bikini, most of it was torn, her body was all gashed, her blonde hair was all really tangled and covered in blood. And she said in the dream, I'm dead, I'm dead, help me. Because it was in a dream, she didn't run away. But the ghost said that she was on Pee Pee Island when the big wave hit. She said right now her mother is trying to give her a telephone call, find out what happened to her, but her mobile phone's on the bottom of the ocean. Her body is now been recovered and it's been put in one of the morgues in Phuket Island, in one of the temples. And the ghost said to this woman, can you please call my mum, tell her what happened to me, and please tell her not to come and collect my body yet, I don't want her to see me like this. Can you please arrange my cremation, and once it's cremated, then call my mum, she can collect my ashes. Can you do that for me? This is my name. And then they gave a series of numbers. And then a woman woke up. And a Thai woman, I never asked her this, or had the opportunity to ask her, but I sometimes figured out why that English girl who died in the tsunami, why she contacted that woman. Because she was married to a man who was lived in London. And so when she woke up her husband and told him what had happened, he said, that is a legitimate London telephone number. And so she told, he told his wife, go and give that a call. If you know any Thai people, many of you are the same. No way, I'm not going to ring up about a ghost. <laughs> so anyway, the husband rang up the number. It was the correct number. It was this woman's mum. And she said that she knew, you know, in her heart, intuitively, that her daughter had died on the island. She knew that's where she was going. And so, you know, she, she wasn't that shocked. And she said, if that's what she said, please go ahead and do the funeral for her. You have my full permission. So the next morning they went over to Phuket Island. It's a few hours drive from Grubi. And when they got there, they went to the temple, which uh, she had told them her body was being kept. and. They had permission to go in there because it was just chaotic. And then when they went there, they saw her exactly as she's seen in a dream. That's how her body looked. They got permission to do the cremation. They did the cremation. After the cremation was finished, they rang up the mum. And the mum came over to from Heathrow to uh, Phuket to collect the ashes. A lot of tears, a lot of thanks. She thought that was it, finished. The next night when they went back to their home in Gwibi, this is a pretty true story. I don't make this one up. I do so, but I'll let you know if I have to make him up. <laughs> when they got back to their home, tired, but kind of happy, then they had a nice rest. And when they both went to sleep, she had another dream. The same woman who died. But now, the way she said it, it's like she'd been to a spa. Just her hair was beautiful, and her face, there's no more cuts and bruises, which would happen in those waves. And she's wearing a beautiful dress. And the woman said to uh, this uh, Thai woman, who was still dreaming, said to her, thank you, thank you, thank you. Look what you've done for me, what you did for my mum. I got so much gratitude for you. And gave them another series of numbers which was not a telephone number, and they won a fortune.
so. <laughs> if it's in the dark and you see a ghost, do not run away. <laughs> Ask for some numbers. 50%, 50% goes to Santi Forest Monastery. <laughs> they need the funds. <laughs> no, real ghost stories. I know a huge number of ghost stories. Even when I was a student, we used to do, I was part of the Psychic Research Society. We'd go and investigating ghosts. And that friend, I keep on mentioning his name, the guy who was a close associate of Stephen Hawkins. So close that there was a movie made about Stephen Hawkins. And this gentleman, Bernard, was, was mentioned in the movie, was featured in the movie. That's how close he was to Stephen. But he's also my best friend, this Bernard Carr. And so we'd go hunting ghosts together. He was a theoretical physicist, professor of theoretical physics in London University. And his hobby was investigating ghosts. And in all those years, the British have been investigating ghosts. Never once, over a hundred years of research, has any ghost ever hurt a human being. They can make you scared, and they can make you pee your pants, <laughs> but that's all. They can't physically hurt you. So please remember that this is from a monk, someone you know, I wouldn't lie to you about this. And number two, it's from someone who did a lot of research on that before they were a monk. So please don't be scared. A lot of times all the ghosts need is some help, some kindness. And if you give them a little bit of kindness and help, it's amazing how they can help you. 50% Santi Forest Monastery. And he's recorded, so we know. <laughs> and now the next question comes from someone who wanted to ask this question prior to lunch. So during deep meditation, I feel an overflow of love and compassion apart from bliss. Is it acceptable in Buddhist teachings? Thank you, Ajahn Brahm. Of course. Love and compassion and bliss, when they both get extremely strong, you can hardly distinguish between the two of them. Sometimes that's what you experience in the bliss states of meditation. Sometimes people describe them as just pure, selfless, incredible love. That's how it feels. You can't make a distinction. Good, thank you. Um, sometimes whilst meditating, it's not possible to remain calm or introspective. Is it, is it better to get out of, into company and be active? This is when one feels anxious. Why is this? No, just stay put. If you stay put, all that restless energy is not fed, and soon it just disappears. Be more patient. I've found this so many times. Sometimes, you know, even Ajahn Brahm, when I start meditating, oh, this is going to be hopeless, I'm too tired, I've been too active, answering too many questions. It's not just in here, it's in there, on the path, walking. <laughs> <laughs> this story is true. I was giving, some, oh my goodness, I'm going to Hong Kong next week. When I went to Hong Kong once, I think in the jockey club, that's a big auditorium, one of the big universities there. When I was there, I gave a talk and a couple of thousand people, and they were asking their questions, and when the talk was finished, you know, we, then from there, you had to walk up to you know, the exit. People were waiting for me. Can I take a photograph? Can I ask a question? You can take a photograph. <laughs> Please do so. Can I ask a question? All the way you know, from the stage right up to the exits. And I'm a human being. I was dying to go to the toilet. And even when you went out the front door, people were waiting for you in the foyer. Oh, I jump around. Can I ask you a question? Can I take a photograph? Can you give me some advice? And finally, finally, I made it into the male toilet. <laughs> and as soon as I got in, 
the male toilet, there was one man just washing his hands, he just finished, he said, oh, Ajahn Brahm, can I ask you about my meditation? <laughs> Even in the male toilets. <laughs> I thought, no place is sacred. <laughs> and I remember that Hong Kong story. Oh, that just really was, uh, took a lot of endurance. So, Go on. <laughs> Hello, you usually say that the first step to letting go of those strong emotions is to first recognize them. I find yeah. it hard sometimes to recognize those emotions and also to some extent the cause of it. Think of it like a brain fog. Any advice? Thank you. Yes, by recognizing it, please always add the magic ingredient of kindness. For example, if I see any one of you, now who are you? And if I just say that, you, know, you can't really connect and understand each other. But if I have some nice kindness, I get my mind with lots of kindness and I look at you, and then you can open up to me. And you're not stiff and solid, and I'm not stiff and solid with that kindness. And then we can understand each other. It's not just recognition, but understanding. And what are these emotions, you know, like, like a brain fog? What, what does it mean, a brain fog? You understand it. Don't give it names, but get to know it until it's a good uh, friend of yours. When you have these good friends, you know, it's a good example of that, all those friends I made in prisons, many people would be just terrified of them. As for me, these were my friends, and they would always protect me. I never ever felt afraid or tense even though they'd kill people, even though they were serial rapists, even though they'd done some terrible crimes. I never felt afraid in their presence. I respected them, and they, I knew they would always respect me. That's what the same with these emotions you have. They'll never harm you, if you know how to respect them. Even like Ajahn Gunha, patting King Cobras, do you think that King Cobra would ever hurt him? Of course not. There was another monk years ago, and Ajahn Chai used to tell the story about him. Uh, Ajahn Tonglak, I think his name was. He would go out into the forest, into the jungles, and if a tiger came in his way, he would just kick the tiger in the backside and get out. I mean, they're real big tigers. Those were not man-eaters, they were monk-eaters. I know Ajahn Chah always used to tell me, look, monks never eat, sorry, tigers never eat monks. <laughs> <laughs> or nuns, yeah. Tiger. But I thought, how do you know? Prove it. Number one, the tiger wouldn't confess. And number two, if they ate the monk, he wouldn't be able to tell anybody he's been eaten. It's gone. So how do you can, can you prove that monks never eat nuns? <laughs> I wouldn't confess. <laughs> that was a nice nun pie I had today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, no, I'm innocent. <laughs> okay. Excellent. Dear Ajahn, my husband sleeps with different women and prostitutes. We have a child who is one years old. My mother-in-law has bipolar and she says it's all my fault. I'm worried for my son's future. According to the Buddha's teachings, what is the path I should take? Stay with him or leave him? Uh, the son or the husband? <laughs> husband, yeah. It's, if he's causing you so, causing you so much difficulty, then, you know, it's it's a very difficult relationship. But then you've got the son to consider as well. So I'm not quite sure what the solution would be. If he's always sleeping with other people, and then you, you try to control that, he doesn't see any sense in his life, and then I don't know if you can have custody of the child. You know, to look after the child and abandon the husband. 
I think basically this is just practicalities. If you can get some evidence, so then you go to some sort of courts, and that does count as domestic abuse. A man like that would not be considered uh, a good example for the little child. The mother is. So you can get rid of the husband and keep the child. But anyway, there's so much more information needed. And you don't need to run away from the rain. <laughs> this is rain falling in Santi Monastery. <laughs> it's not ordinary rain. <laughs> it's called holy water. <laughs> you get blessed. <laughs> Unfortunately, I miss out. <laughs> Okay. Ajahn, could you kindly explain or teach about the first step of the Eightfold Path, Samaditi? Yeah, right view. If it's a perfect right view, that perfect right view is when you uh, experience what we call um, stream winning. You know, they have a synonym for being a stream winning, a soul one. I'm not talking about someone who's entered the stream, the path of being a stream winner, who's actually got that uh, basically label, if you like. And uh, sometimes they get the name Dittipato, like attain to right view. It means that they can see things properly. And the thing which they see more than anything else, there's basically no one in here. To understand this, uh, nice and easily, not theoretically, there was many years ago when I was still in Thailand, Ajahn Chah would start to get sick. His health started to deteriorate. You know why his health started to deteriorate? Because he spent so much time sitting down answering people's questions <laughs> and never got any rest. <laughs> That's true. So if sometimes I say, I can't come to Santi this week, now you know why. <laughs> I want to try and preserve myself for others. <laughs> but one thing we thought of, this was Thailand, many of those monks, we did enough research to find out, in, even in India, in the time of the Buddha, they would have saunas. Saunas were not invented in Sweden. They had them in India you know, when the Buddha was alive. So we decided to build a sauna. Two reasons. One, many of the monks wanted to have a sauna. And the other reason was we could invite Ajahn Chah over once a week to have a sauna. So when Ajahn Chah came over for his sauna, that part of it worked perfectly. He came over every week and we prepare a sauna for him. But before he had his sauna, he would give a Dhamma talk. Now, you know how much I respect Ajahn Chah and how much he's praised. Many times Ajahn Chah's talks and sermons were really boring. But every now and again, Ajahn Chah would hit the spot. You can never tell why, when, but this evening, Ajahn, afternoon, Ajahn Chah's talk was incredible, amazing. And I was just so inspired. I mentioned this before, like tears come to your eyes. It's really sort of uplifting, inspiring. Usually my job would be to help him in the sauna. There's other monks doing that. So I went to the back of the meditation hall and just sat down for two hours meditating. No cushions or anything. I didn't mind the hard concrete because my mind was just way up there in the clouds. And had a lo really lovely meditation. And when you have a nice meditation, you've got this stupid smile on your face. And I thought I'd go <laughs> and try and help my teacher. When I went towards where the sauna was, I realized I was too late. Because I saw Ajahn Chah, he'd had his sauna, washed, dressed, and was coming in the opposite direction on the path. And there's no way we could avoid each other. We're about to cross. Just Ajahn Brahm with his stupid smile and his great teacher with his driver. 
And that's one of the most wonderful experiences I had with Ajahn Chung. He stopped. Because I'd just come out of a very lovely meditation, he started to read my mind. And not just saying that, my mind was so clear. It's hard to explain this, but I could feel him inside my mind. And for once, I didn't want to kick him out. <laughs> for once, I was proud. I just had a nice meditation. Come and have a look. I'm not as stupid as you think. <laughs> These are weird experiences, but that's with honesty, the best way I can explain it. And after, you know, he left, went out, uh, outside of my mind, and then he looked at me, and eye to eye, not angry, but not light-hearted, but really fiercely. Brahma Wangso. That's a full name. Ajahn Brahm is for your convenience, because it's a shortened form. Brahma Wangso. Why? He said that in Thai. Tamai. Why? And he paused. And I said, I replied, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're still a young monk, still quite stupid. And that was the most ridiculous answer you could have given to this great teacher who was trying his hardest to enlighten you. I don't know. <laughs> and what did he do? Exactly what you just did. He laughed his head off. <laughs> These Westerners, even they got good degrees from Cambridge, <laughs> they're as dumb as could be. <laughs> so then he stopped laughing. He said, Brahma Wang, sir, I will tell you the answer. Just like you, I went so quiet. You're getting the answer to a really deep question personal for one of the greatest monks of that age. If anyone asks you that question again, why? This is the answer. So listen carefully everybody. So the answer is, there's nothing. There's nothing. And he looked at me with this wonderful kindness. Do you understand? Do you understand? And I said, yes. And he looked at me and said, no, you don't. <laughs> 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 and I went from being really high to going right and being lower than the worm on the, on the path. <laughs> and then he went away. <laughs> but I'll never forget that. So what's the answer to the question, why? Nothing. Nothing. Do you understand? <laughs> no, oh, yeah, sure, I agree with that. <laughs> But that's a, you know some of those examples of times with you know great teachers. You never ever sort of uh, demean that experience and feel I'm so lucky I was that you know he managed to see how clear my mind was and give me some instructions. There's nothing. If you can allow that to sink in, what are you got to be afraid of? What what do you want? There's nothing. You afraid of getting wet? There's nothing. So it gives you such a huge sense of freedom. You're getting closer to what enlightenment is. What does it mean? This is where you take that statement. You allow it to stay with you. And the mind explores it. As it explores it, it sees so many different aspects of what that means. And when you see the deepest parts of that word, there's nothing, and see what it really means, again, that's where the great insights come from. A lot of times there's a resistance. There is nothing. Oh, that's stupid. But then when you actually have the courage and the stillness to let that stay in your mind, then the mind explores it, like it explores the cave, like the cave, the big cave today. And when we first found that, 
I know Rhoda, you were there when we found the cave, weren't you? Yeah, you did, yeah. I think you told me about it and we excavated it. But we explored it. You know, once it was there, full of sand, you know, we paid a lot of money to excavate all the sand with a, a back, not back cover, front end loader or something. So a huge amount of sand to put it in the front and then uh, to explore it. We didn't know how deep it went. So that's what we do. This is important, having a cave where you can meditate. Caves were just so traditional in Buddhist countries. We had one here, let's develop it. Develop it, and we just take the sand out. So, and put that Buddha statue. To this day, I've got so much respect to one of the nuns, and that was Patachara, her name was. You know, she was a nun, she's an earth. Ten P scepter, wasn't she? And we tried to get her a visa, but then it got rejected. And I told her, "Look, hang in there. I'm going to fight this. I can be quite aggressive, especially with governments." But then she decided to leave. I was really disappointed on that. She also did the stonework and the mosaics around the big stupa. But she carved that Buddha statue, you see there, just herself, no one else. It's not an artist, it's this amazing sort of ability to, to visualize space. There's one nun. Anyway, uh, next question. Yes, a lay person can attain Nibbana. Let's put that question, uh, answer that question with a metaphor. Can you, a lay person, walk to Perth, Australia, to Bodhinyana Monastery? Can you do that? You'd be dumb if you did. There are <laughs> cars, trains, aircrafts, boats. For goodness sake, don't just kill yourself walking all the way to Bodhinyana Monastery in Perth. Get an aircraft. We'll pick you up from the airport. So, the answer is yes. But you'd be dumb to do it as a layperson. That's why we have a Sangha for. Why do you think the Buddha started the ordination of men and women? So you don't have to work so hard to become enlightened. So the answer is yes, but n very few people do that. Many lay people go on the internet, claim to be enlightened. <laughs> but be careful. If you want to be enlightened, come and join up. Good lifestyle. Ah. If I was, if I as a health professional help facilitate an abortion in the third trimester, will I accumulate bad karma for taking another's life? Thank you. In the third trimester, usually most abortions happen earlier on. Remember, this is number one about this. Of course, being a monk for so many years, I've talked to so many women who've had abortions, and I sometimes feel. Please excuse me, inadequate. I haven't experienced an abortion. I actually haven't caused an abortion. And I know that talking to women who've had abortions, what it does and how much, how serious that is. No woman, woman I've ever met does that lightly. It's the most difficult decision they've ever made in their life. And if they decide to have that abortion, it just messes up their brain, their mind, a huge amount. So straight away, if there's any women here who've ever had an abortion, you have all of my loving kindness and metta. It's the right decision or wrong decision. You made that 
decision as best you possibly could in such difficult circumstances. You have my 100, 200, 300 th million thousand percent forgiveness, whatever I can. The difficult decision to make. So I wanted to make sure you could be of as much service as possible. And one of the things which I insist on talking to pe women about, that the Buddha described the beginning of a human life as when the stream of consciousness, when conscious activity first manifests in the mother's womb. Manifests, I mean it first appears. Basically when that little being growing in your tummy can respond to pain and pleasure. And that can be known even recently, some I was discussing this with the doctor, and he sort of told me just roughly, you know, when that happens. Certainly, in the first trimester, consciousness does not manifest in a mother's womb. In that first trimester, if you have an abortion, technically, it's not counted as killing a human being. And I say that basically to get you off the hook. I'm your defense attorney. So if any woman has an abortion, I'm not here say, bad girl, don't you ever come in Santi Monastery ever again. Crikey. That's not the way to deal with people who are, you know, having these incredibly difficult decisions to make. So it's not considered to be killing another being. It's that being growing in your tummy that is an extension of you. But if it's after that third trimester, it may be. I'm not sure what the current opinions are. But also, what happens if you have things like euthanasia? Is that killing? What is the definition of suicide? Intentionally ending your own life, correct? So did the Lord Buddha commit suicide? I love answering, asking these questions to make people think and look at these things deeper. First of all, very pertinent to why we're here today, once the Buddha was enlightened, Siddhartha Gautama was enlightened, Mara came to see him and said, okay, I, I give in, you're an enlightened being, I'm not going to you know, try and convince you otherwise ever again. But now you're enlightened, for goodness sake, don't go and teach others. Teaching others is a really a pain in the butt. I can confirm that. Is that also true? <laughs> and he said, uh, so don't teach others, just live a happy time and just go off into Parinirvana. Leave existence. And the Buddha's response, you can check this up if you wish, the Buddha's response says, no, I will not you know, enter Parinirvana and just pass away, disappear, until I have established a strong Sangha of bhikkhus who are all types of enlightenment, on the way to enlightenment, fully enlightened. And I've established a full Sangha of bhikkhunis who were enlightened on the way to enlightenment, until I've established a community of white-robed female followers and white-robed male followers on the path to enlightenment. Once I've established those four groups, those four assemblies, then I will enter Parinirvana. And what was it, 45 years later, the, under the chapel of shrine at Vesali, Mara came to see the Buddha again and reminded him of that vow and said, look now, 
the Bhikkhu Sangha, there's so many Arahats in that Bhikkhu Sangha, great monks, very strong. There are so many enlightened Bhikkhunis, so many of them. The Bhikkhuni Sangha is strong. So many white robe lay women, white, white robe lay men, now on the path to enlightenment, really strong. You've completed your vow. Now, would you like to leave this world? And that's when the Buddha said, okay, in three months time, I will enter Parinirvana. I will die. I'll pass away. And I can't really call it dying. And it was only afterwards that Ananda you know, said, oh, please live forever. And he said, it's too late. I've already said I'm going to go in three months' time. That was a willed decision to depart this body. And he had the power to stay if he wished. He decided not to. Is that suicide? It doesn't matter if you are self or not there. It's still deliberately end the stream of consciousness. But anyway, I say that, I don't want an answer. I want you to think about it. What is suicide? Have you ever seen people sacrifice their own life for their kid? People who sometimes dive into the water to try and save somebody from a rip current. Is that suicide? Because you're sacrificing for something else, you've got nothing in it for yourself. It's never regarded as any bad act. But anyway, what this does, it makes this whole idea of suicide and abortion and euthanasia very, very complex. It's not a simple uh, idea. And also what happens, euthanasia. When I get old and keep on telling the same jokes day after day after day, is that the time <laughs> that you should start recommending doctors who can <laughs> give me voluntary euthanasia? <laughs> Even how many of you, you know, would can see the benefits, or well, if you have these terrible diseases. I know that people say there's so much medication available, you don't have to suffer so much. That's always in theory. I've been to many hospices, much palliative care places. In theory, some of these medications can work. In practice, many times they don't. And I've been even years ago with people with lung cancer and just struggling. Every breath is a torture. And maybe they not be on the path to enlightenment, they not be meditators or Buddhists. And for them, when they come and beg you, a jambaram, can you please find a gun, take me round the back and shoot me? And they're serious, it's not a joke. They can't take it anymore. And if that is your mother or father, or you know, your dear one, you love them so much, how do you feel? So sometimes it's kind of cruel. This is the answer. This was, please, this is not just a question, this is a Dhamma teaching. There was this one uh, member of our Buddhist community over in Perth, a very good lady. I always remember her because she was our vice president once, and she went over uh, to see His Holiness the Dalai Lama over in Damsara in India. When she went there, now she said she was the vice president of the Buddhist Society of Western Australia. Apparently that meant something. So she got priority to see the Dalai Lama. So please join the committee of Santi Buddhist Monastery. <laughs> or the 
<laughs> you don't realize the benefits. And anyway, so she got priority. Still had to wait for a couple of days. And while she was waiting, in the mornings, she'd always do some meditation in the main hall. And she told me one day how difficult that meditation was. Because she went there early, sitting there by herself, started getting very peaceful. And if you want to know what a hindrance is, this guy sat next to her. And her mistake was opening her eyes to see who it was. And it was Richard Gere. <laughs> that was the end of her meditation. <laughs> I remember when she told me that story, I just laughed my head off. He's only a guy, for goodness sake, only five candles. Oh, but we should go. And this lady was single. <laughs> Anyhow, that uh, she had a dog. The dog got cancer. And many of you had this experience. She took the dog to the vet. Spent a lot of money getting all sorts of treatment for her dog because her dog was like her child. She loved that dog. And eventually, the vet told her, look, your dog is dying of cancer. There's nothing more I can do. Please let me euthanize the dog. Give it the injection so the dog will pass away and end its suffering. What would you do? Number one, you care for that dog. You don't want to see it suffer. Number two, you're a Buddhist and you're not supposed to kill anything. So what can you do? Fortunately, she had this wonderful piece of advice. If that's your dog and you love that dog, ask that dog. It's the dog's choice. Do you want to die or do you want to carry on? If that, if that dog decides to carry on, it's the dog's decision. You're just conveying the, dis conveying the decision to the dog. You're not killing it. And I'll tell you what happened. She wanted to practice like this, so she said, can I just talk to my dog for a few moments? She just took the dog into a quiet corner of the vet's office. And I held her dog. He loved that little dog. And that poor dog was dying of cancer. She looked that dog in the eye. You know, hugged it, sh showed how much she loved her dog, and asked it, you know, you got cancer, you know that. Do you want to die? Do you want to be euthanized? Or do you want to carry on? If that is your dog, you will know straight away what it wants. If you love it, care for it. You need to ask the question first, that's all. So they asked the question. She got the clear response from the dog. I mean, dog can't speak English. It's like mind to mind, heart to heart. The dog said, no, I don't want to die. So she took the dog back to the vet and said, no, I'm taking the dog home. And the vet scolded her. You stupid, you Buddhists are supposed to be kind. You've got no compassion at all. That dog is suffering. I've got to euthanize it. No. She took it home. And the dog was, sorry, the vet was really unhappy. Six months later, she took the dog back to the vet. It made full recovery all by itself. <laughs> and the dog checked it. It's the same dog? Yes. It's in total remission. You Buddhists are so compassionate and wise. <laughs> totally the opposite of what the vet said before. If it's euthanasia, I have no right, me, to tell you what to do. I've got no right to tell you to have an abortion or not to have an abortion. The job of a friend or a teacher is to serve. Most difficult decision, whatever decision you make, I'll always support you, whatever that decision is. And number two, if it's somebody else, say your mum in a hospital bed, 
you're the senior son. It's a Chinese tradition. You have to give the word to the doctors. Do you euthanize or not? Pull the plug or keep on going? What do you do? You ask your father, ask your mum. It's not that hard to get the right answer from them. As long as you ask, hold their hand, just even stroke them, kiss them or something, and then just ask mummy, do you want to go? Do you want to carry on? You ask that question, you get the answer almost every time. That's how it works. So that's how we deal with, you know, death. Sometimes it's the kindest thing to do. And sometimes a person who, you know, is having their life terminated, that's what they really want. It's their choice. What do you reckon? Okay. So we have a vote. How many people feel that Ajahn Brahm has been talking too much and his life needs to be terminated? <laughs> <laughs> or maybe it's the microphone's fault. Terminate the microphone. Well, according to all the questions I'm getting, I think they would love you to leave and answer questions. To leave? <laughs> to leave. Oh, okay. <laughs> Okay, carry on. See, Ajahn, you mentioned the four meditations Buddha taught were the four jhanas. Can yeah. you please explain where Satipatthana fits in that? Ah, okay. You cannot do Satipatthana without doing jhanas. What does a Satipatthana Vipassana meditation say? Each one of those four, I call them focuses of mindfulness, not foundations of mindfulness, on the body, on Vedana, on Chitta, on Dhamma. What do you have to complete before you even start doing the Satipatthana properly? Vinaya Loke Abhicha Dhamma I'm just mentioning that in Pali to prove to you I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Vinaya means having restrained, uh, disciplined, uh, lessened, locate abhijja and dhammanasang. Those of you who do the vipassana and study the words in English, it's usually translated as having abandoned grief and covetousness for the world. What on earth does that mean? It's a terrible translation. If you look in the rest of the suttas, loke abhija is a synonym for the first hindrance. That's what it says in the commentaries. That's what you see in the suttas, mostly in the Anguttu and Nikaya. They call the first hindrance uh, loke abhija instead of kamachanda. The second hindrance is two suttas. The second hindrance is described as Dhammanasa. So the commentaries to both those suttas are accurate. They've got grounds for saying that what you have to complete before you start even doing the Satipatthana, any one of them, is having abandoned those first two hindrances. The commentary said abandoning the first two of a common set means it's a shorthand used in Pali in those days, for having abandoned the five hindrances. How do you abandon the five hindrances? Jhanas. That's in the Nala Kapana Sutta. The only way to abandon the five hindrances so they don't arise for a long period of time is by emerging from one of the jhanas. And then also, the third Satipatthana, just to rub it in, the third Satipatthana is contemplating chitta. The mind. Do you know what the mind actually is? The mind is not thought. If you want to find, say, 
I don't know how many chemists are here, want to understand the nature of gold. You have to get some pure gold with no trace sediments in it. Then you can do your experiments and find out what is the nature of gold. And it's just gold and nothing else but gold. No tin, no iron, just gold. This is the Buddha simile, by the way. And once you have pure gold, you can understand what it is and how it works. The only way you can understand what the chitta is, is to have just chitta, nothing else. Chitta is the name for the sixth sense, the mind. You just got mind experience, nothing else, no body, no sight, sounds, smell, taste. In other words, experience of jhanas. Have a look in the Satipatthana Sutta and see how they explain understanding jitta. You do need those, the data from jhanas to be able to do that. You need the freedom from the five hindrances to be able to do it. Basically, putting it briefly but accurately, you need to have the jhanas to be able to do Satipatthana. You can argue with me as much as you like. I know my stuff. Okay, next question. Thank you, Ajahn. Sadhu, we should also say sadhu from the teaching. Sadhu, 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 sadhu. You like that? <laughs> Very good. Sadhu, and thank you.